the Moon. Earth's natural satellite orbits approximately 384-400 km away. A celestial object the scientists have studied for thousands of years, using its regular motions to mark the passage of time in calendars. Every 29.5 days, the Moon completes an orbit around the Earth. However, this orbit is not flat. More specifically, there is a 5 degree difference between the angle of the Moon's orbit and the ecliptic plane, the 2D plane on which the Earth orbits around the Sun. For half of the month, the Moon is slightly higher than the plane of the ecliptic, and for the other half, it drops below it. Naturally, this means there are two crossover points or nodes, an ascending node and a descending node that mark the point over the moon goes from one side over to other. It is these nodes that move over the course of the 18.6 year cycle, slowly rotating around the planet in one complete revolution. The nodes themselves are what cause the problem. To understand why, let's recap what we know about tides. You may already be familiar with how the moon's gravity pulls the earth water towards it, causing a bulge in sea levels on the side closet to it that we call high tide. You likely also know that this happens on the side of the planet furthest away from the moon. Rather than being caused by gravity, the second bulge is caused by centrifugal forces as the Earth and the Moon's gravitational pull on each other causes them to behave like two dancers holding each other by the arms and spinning across the dance floor. While it's mostly the Moon moving due to the Earth being much more massive, the Earth is also swung around a little. The water behind it is thus trying to fill off into space through its resources spinning, causing the second high tide. The Sun also has a role to play in a tide formation, albeit to a lesser degree. It is a bigger mass that would cause a greater pull of it ever closer, but its further distance means that the Sun's effect is only one-third as big as the Moon. When the Moon and Sun are aligned, we get extra-large tides called spring tides. This happens six to eight times a year. When not aligned, they partially cancel each other out, causing smaller tidal extremes known as neoptides. Consider the influence of lunar nodes on this tidal tug of war. During spring tides, the pool of the Sun and the Moon are working in unison causes the highest tides and the largest risk of floods. However, the Sun and Moon are never more aligned than they are at the node. During the rest of each 9.3 year phase, they are not quite tugging in the same direction. So, tides are more temperate. At the node, that's where things get more serious, and the risk of floods becomes highest. The last time this alignment occurred in September 2015, the UK and US both issued major flood warnings to their citizens. In September, the UK and US both issued major flood warnings to their citizens. In September itself, there were floods, Albeit minor ones, but it was only when heavy rain combined with the strength of the lunar nodes a couple of months later that the real damage was inflicted. In the US, in October, South Carolina saw flash flooding that caused property damage and people having to be rescued by emergency services. At the end of December 2015, the UK was hit by some of the worst floods it had seen in a century. Combined with the power of storm Desmond, flooding and storm damage caused an estimated $1.3 billion in damages. These floods can be highly damaging, but that in and of itself doesn't completely explain NASA's worry for the upcoming alignment in mid-2013. 
There is an extra element at play beyond the regular rhythm of the rising flood risk we have been seeing throughout the course of human history. Unfortunately, the next node's alignment with the Sun promises to be particularly devastating. The danger is that this phenomenon is combined with an already strained system. Even more strained than it was in 2015, climate change has resulted in steadily raising sea levels when the next node aligns with the sun in the mid-2030s. This will likely lead to a dramatic increase in floods on planet Earth. Worryingly, a new study led by the NASA Sea Level Change Science Team predicts that almost all U.S. mainland coastlines, Hawaii and Guam, will experience a huge leap in flood numbers when this happens. Some predictions claim this mode alignment could cause four times the amount of flooding from one decade to the next, damaging infrastructure and changing coastlines globally. This will inevitably affect human life, impacting shelter, clean water supplies and electricity, as well as increasing the risk of waterborne disease outbreaks like hepatitis A and cholera. Additionally, receding flood water can create stagnant pools where mosquitoes gather, spreading diseases like malaria. This has a knock-on effect on economic issues, making coastal life unaffordable due to increased insurance costs or an inability to find insurance, potentially causing a reduction in asset value in the community. Consequently, this lunar nodal cycle will damage the quality of life in coastal communities, where infrastructure may not be rebuilt or adopted to this force of nature. It is not just bad for humans. Ilya Roklin, a visiting professor at Rutgers University, analyzed that the peak of the lunar wobble, where high tides are higher, can drone sailed marshes. Sail marshes are a habitat for a range of species, such as invertebrates, and these floods can cause these captures to drown. This, in turn, affects other species like fish, seabirds, and others who rely on invertebrates to survive. Sail marshes hold a multitude of marine life, including 75% of all fishery species, impacting the food chains of humans and animals and causing disturbances to their natural habitat, affecting their populations. While this may seem fairly doom and gloom, it is interesting to note that not all ecosystems on the planet are negatively affected by flooding and high tides. Ecologist Neil Saintlin of Macquarie University analyzed that the lunar nodal cycle heavily impacts the expansion and contraction of mangrove canopy cover over most of the Australian continent. The analysis showed that the peaks of lunar nodal cycle coincided with the cover of the mangrove canopy. When the lunar wobble is at its minimum phase, it causes the mangrove ecosystems to become very dry, leading to thinner canopy cover. Yet, when the lunar wobble is at its maximum phase, mangrove growth increases. Mangrove canopies are beneficial to Earth's environment as they are complex ecosystems that fight against climate change, protect wildlife, and shield coastlines. They can also absorb four times as much carbon dioxide as rainforests of the same size. Their growth is the vital for the welfare of our planet. So, it is not all downside. Still, it is clear that if we don't plan ahead, coastal cities and environments will face a serious crisis. The all-important question then is, what can we do about it? One method is better protection. As mentioned previously, the protection and registration of mangroves can act as a shield against flooding mitigating the vulnerability of communities on the coastlines. 
Specifically, mangroves can avert damage by decreasing the height and energy of waves as they pass through the mangrove forests. The above ground roots and branches diminish the height of waves, ultimately stopping them from emerging onto the seabed and engulfing the sediments. Mangroves roots and branches also reduce wind energy. Densely packed mangroves can have the height of a wave through just 100 meter passage, compared to 500 meters in an open forest with more sparse roots and branches. Preservation and reforestation of mangrove or plants with similar capabilities can serve as a great shield against upcoming floods. Another possible solution is to learn how to live with these flood-heavy conditions, working with nature rather than against it. For example, let's take a look at the flood defenses in the Netherlands. Where one-third of the country is below sea level and another third is at risk of flooding. They've built infrastructure that works with water and manages the risk sea levels. They do this by designing facilities like polders, bits of land below sea level that have been reasserted from a body of water. Polders are always fully or partially surrounded by an embankment to keep the water out, whether from the sea or a river. These polders offer a network of drainage canals and pumps to manage water levels by disposing of excess water and running water back to the sea or river to prevent it from running over land. Polders can be used to protect houses, farms, and factories and are extensively used throughout the country. The Netherlands also built dams and utilized sand dunes to create ways to stay dry in their swampy land. This shows that there are always a which we can observe nature and live alongside it. Best wishes and see you next time.